Hey, Oakwood. Um, this is kind of odd to present to uh, a room that's basically empty. There's a few people out there. You just can't see them. And uh, anyway, we're, we're, we want to be we want to be a good team player in our community. We want our community to know that we're, we're part of the community. We want what's best for the lake area too. And so the reason we've chosen to cancel this weekend and this coming week is just to make sure we're, we're playing our part. We're doing a responsible uh, act as part of the community. Um, it does say in, Rev, in Romans chapter 13 that we're to be subject to governing authorities. And so when the World Health Organization declares a pandemic and when our president declares a national emergency, that we need to be responsible and act accordingly. So that's what we've chosen to do. I know some of you might not agree with that, but that's okay. That's the choice we've made. And we'll, make, uh, we'll, we'll adjust as we go because we're in this time of uncertainty we don't know. Um, and that, I would also like to say it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to be people of hope, to represent Jesus well. Um, because the, that's going to be the top of conversation about, oh no, what are we going to do? And we can talk to them about Jesus. I'd like to read to you a few verses from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, or a pandemic breaks out against us. Even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, no matter what happens, are people of hope. We're to keep our chin up. We're to keep our hope in Jesus Christ because no matter whether it's a pandemic or not, no matter whether it's life or death, our hope is in Him. And that's what we're going to do. So um, hang in there, Oakwood, and we'll see what the days ahead bring. Thanks. I trust you to save me, Lord God, and I won't be afraid. My power and my strength come from you and you have saved me, Isaiah 12, 2. God not only has power and strength, but he graciously uses it to save us. Um, we have nothing to fear when we know that God is our power and our strength. Well, I guess my favorite verse, many of them, but Isaiah 40, 31, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I think the promise there is that wherever we are in life's journey, God takes care of us walking, running, flying. God says, I'm there for you, and I'll give you the strength you need. And I'm so thankful for that. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I love that verse because it's a perfect reminder that the Lord is with us no matter what's going on every day through every circumstance. Okay, Oakwood, here we are, our second week in the series, The Gospel According to Isaiah. Today we're going to talk about negotiating the settlement. Over the past few weeks, we've been selling Cheryl's Folks Place, and we're working on this uh, stuff with realtors and all that, and we're negotiating the settlement. We have an offer, and there's counter offers and contracts and contingencies, and I'm way out of my element. I'm way over my head, but, but I'm in the middle of it. As the trustee, I'm in the middle of it, and I have wise counselors to help me try to figure out exactly what to say, what to do, what to sign, and all that kind of stuff. And so we're making it, and, and, and I understand that I need to do the right thing and not only for the benefit of my family, but I have to do the right thing legally because if we don't do it legally, you could really get in trouble for, uh, for doing that and the, the agreement or the settlement will fall, would fall apart. So as we've been going through the prophets over the past few months, it's been challenging to say the least. There are certain parts of reading the prophets and it's like, wow, this is so intense. This, is, this, this keeps, we find out about this judgment and this ev the, the evidence about the rebellion of God's people again and again and again and and we know that we're guilty and that the evidence is huge. And, and we, would, we would all say that we want justice, but when it comes to standing before God, we're, we're, we're afraid of that. What, what, what's the justice going to be? And there's these constant calls in the book of Isaiah and the other prophets for, for God's people to repent. 
And we read things that we're not sure even the prophets understood. When it comes to predicting the future, there's a, a number of concepts that we introduced you to. We said that if you're reading something in the prophets and it's predicting the future, to go ahead and take your pen and write in your margin, script. Or if you're reading something in, in, the, in the prophets and it's, you, you think in your mind, that sounds like what Jesus did or that sounds like who Jesus is. Write shadow in your margin because it's talking about Jesus. We said there were three horizons when you look at predictive prophecy. The first horizon is, is a prediction the prophet makes and it's going to happen during or near the lifetime of the prophet. The second horizon was when they would predict something that's going to happen in or through Jesus Christ. And then the third horizon was a prediction of something that would happen during or after the second coming of Jesus Christ. A number of weeks ago, Marcus talked about telescoping prophecy, that when there's a prophecy made and, and, and you, you look through the centuries and you see, oh, that's where, that's where it was fulfilled. And then a few centuries later, you find out it was fulfilled more than once, and we were introduced to that concept. It makes the prophets kind of hard to understand. It, it, it really does, and sometimes our, uh, our approach is guess and go, and, and that's my approach sometimes, just like it is yours. That's probably not the best way to do it, but sometimes that's the, the, the best we have, and you read through, and you're trying to understand it, and, and, and then you find one of the greatest helps is the New Testament. Praise God for the New Testament to help us understand the Old Testament. And, and when the New Testament writer says that something that is written in the Old Testament is referring to Jesus, we need to pay attention to their interpretation. That's, that's what we need to do. And so we're going to do that today as we look through a few passages in the book of Isaiah. So again, Isaiah was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. 700 years. That is simply amazing. And so we call it the gospel according to Isaiah. It's not the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's the gospel according to Isaiah. So last week we began, we were in chapters 1 through 6, and we came to what I think is a pretty clear understanding that the holy God is filing a lawsuit against his people, Isaiah chapter 1, and then as he goes on through the book, and even in those first few chapters, he, he lays out the evidence about how sinful and rebellious his people are. And we see ourselves. We, we, we see ourselves, when, when you get to the New Testament, it says things like, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's true, that's us. And the, the evidence in the Old Testament just, just all is behind those, that verse in Romans chapter 3. And so we know that there's, there's bad news. That there's, there's bad news because we're guilty. But then right away at the beginning of, of the book of Isaiah, God says this. Chapter 1, verse 18. We saw this last week. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And right out of the gate, God says, I want to settle out of court. I, 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 want, to, I want to settle out of court. And if he says that, we should sit up and take notice. Because God wants, to, he, he wants us to know where he's headed. He wants us to know where he's headed with this, this good news. He wants to settle out of court. That's great. To know that he has a plan, and he has a plan not only to forgive sin, but he also has a plan to proclaim and to demonstrate he is holy. He's just, because that's who he is, and God cannot deny himself. So he has to have a plan where he can forgive sin and also proclaim his holiness and his justice. So if God is going to settle out of court, what does he need to do? What, is it, what, what does God need to do as if we could advise him? What, what does he need to do? And, and I have five things I'd like to say, and basically these, these five statements are taking us through the next five sermons, okay? So we're just going to mention number one first, and we'll come back to it just a little bit. The first thing that God needs to do is that if he's going to negotiate this settlement, if we're going to settle out of court, God must be the one to come and meet with us. God must be the one to come and meet with us. We'll see that in chapter 7 and chapter 9 in just a minute. We can't go to him. He's a holy God. We can't approach him. So you, you look in the scriptures in Philippians chapter 2 where it says Jesus leaves heaven. He, he leaves heaven to come, to become a servant and to die for our sin. That he has to do that. If he doesn't do that, there's no hope for us. There can be no settlement. In Matthew chapter 1, it says that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. In John chapter 1, it says the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. God took on flesh in order to to come and to meet with us. If there's going to be a settlement, 
we have to meet together and God must be the one to come and meet with us because we can't go to him. Next week, we'll look at Isaiah chapter 40, that if there's going to be a negotiated settlement, then God must be strong enough to make it happen. God must be strong enough to make it happen. In Isaiah 40, it's kind of a review of creation, and it goes beyond that, but in creation, how did God create? He spoke. He spoke, and he created out of nothing. He creates the universe out of nothing. That's incredible. It says in Isaiah 40 that he takes the, all the water of the earth and he puts it in the palm of his hand. That, that's incredible. How, how could God do that? He, he takes the mountains and he puts it on a pair of scales and he weighs it out. The, the dirt of the world, he, it's just dust to him. How, how big is he? How, how strong is he? When he, when he? when he made the heavens, he, it's like he took a tape measure and he, he stretches out the tape measure to measure the heavens. That's where God is, and we'll see that next week in Isaiah chapter 40. If God's going to settle out of court, he must be the one to come and meet with us, and he must be strong enough to make it happen. In Isaiah 43 and through 45, God must demonstrate that he is qualified to do it. We'll, we'll see in a few weeks that again and again in that chapter, God says things like, there's only one God. God's saying it. Before me, there was no God formed. After me, there will not be another God. I am the only God. He says things like this. I am the Savior. There is no Savior except me. And you're thinking, well, I thought Jesus is a Savior. <laughs> yeah, he's God. God must demonstrate he's qualified to do it. He's the only God, the only Savior, the only Lord. And he says, there is none except me. That's why he's going to negotiate the settlement. Fourth, a number of weeks out, it's going to be God must be willing to pay the full price. In Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, Isaiah 53, one of the best chapters of the Bible, it talks about the one who comes is going to be pierced through for our transgressions. He's going to be crushed for our iniquities. It'll say things like, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. It's Jesus. That if there's going to be this settlement out of court, God must be willing to pay the full price. Because all the evidence says we're bankrupt. And it's like, praise God, this is such good news. And then about five weeks from now, God must let us know what it will cost us. God must let us know what it will cost us. Isaiah 55, where God says something like this. Come, buy without cost. I think what he's saying there is, Come, agree to the settlement. It's not going to cost you anything, but you have to come. And we're going to see that in Isaiah 55. So today, jumping back to the first one I mentioned, God must be the one to come and meet with us. We need to look at two passages in Isaiah, and, and we're going to look at them, and, and you're going to say, hey, it sounds like Christmas. I know. Isaiah 7, verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the, uh, whether in the uh, deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Flip over to Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, it talks about Joseph, and it talks about Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. And in verse 22, it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Matthew is letting us know that Isaiah is indeed referring to the coming of the Christ. Isaiah chapter 9 Beginning in verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. You kind of read that and you're going, whoa, what's that about? Naphtali and Zebulun. Well, you'll see in just a second. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Down to verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And you would say, you would ask a question like, well, is that really talking about Jesus? Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, <laughs> to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And so, you know, we hear Christmas as we read those, those passages. And the best thing out of Matthew is he's telling us that what Isaiah predicted 700 years before is about Jesus. And if God is going to settle out of court, how does he negotiate the settlement? We said, first of all, God must be the one to come and meet with us. Well, how's he going to do that? Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, Ahaz is the king. He's the wicked king of Judah. You have the lower two uh, tribes of Israel are called Judah. The northern ten tribes are called Israel. At that time, Israel and Syria are allying together, and they want Judah to join them. Ahaz does not want to do that. Ahaz would rather be an ally of Assyria. God is saying to Ahaz through Isaiah, don't ally yourself with any of those. Just trust me. Assyria is not going to come and conquer you. They're not going to do that. And, and, um, and, and what, what the Lord says is, uh, Isaiah says to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the highest depths or in the, excuse me, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. Ask anything you want, as deep as the grave and as high as the heaven. And God can do it. Just ask anything you want. And Ahaz's response is, well, I'm not going to put God to the test. Well, he's a wicked king. In, in 2 Kings chapter 12, you find that Ahaz, he, he burned up some of his children, offering them to idols. That's the kind of king that Ahaz was, a wicked king, and has this phony concern about God's honor when he hasn't cared about it up till this point. And so it's like what God says through Isaiah is, God will give you a sign. Whether you want it or not, he's going to give you a sign. And he, and, um, he says, the virgin will conceive. That's like impossible. How in the world could that be? How in the world can, could God do that? In fact, when he, when he says, um, I'll give you a sign, he says uh, in verse, um, verse 13, then Isaiah said, hear now you house of David, where he doesn't really even address Ahaz the king. He's addressing the Davidic dynasty. And he's saying that in, in years from now, here's what's going to happen. And a virgin, the virgin will conceive. Is it really a virgin? There's a debate. Is it a young woman or a virgin? Well, you go to Matthew and Matthew clarifies. Matthew and Luke both clarify that she indeed is a virgin. It, it, it uses the, the article, uh, the definite article, the, the virgin will conceive. Some English translations have a virgin. The Hebrew and the Greek both have the virgin. There's, if you talk about the virgin, everybody knows who that is. It's, it's, it's Mary. The, the virgin will conceive and she will be with child. That's impossible. I know. Unless you're God. I know. You're going to have a son. That's impossible. You're going to call him Emmanuel, God with us. That's impossible. Not for God. Not for God. And we read in the, in, in the Matthew and we read in Luke that they both elaborate and say things like, it's of the Holy Spirit. The, the one being born is of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he's going to save his people. He's God with us. That if God is going to settle out of court, he must come and meet with us. And that means God is going to do the impossible. Some would say there's dual fulfillment. You can read chapter 8. We're not going to do that. The, I, if, if I remember correctly, it's like Isaiah then marries a virgin and she conceives and has a child. So it could be that telescoping prophecy. But we know from Matthew that this, this, these passages are indeed talking about Jesus Christ. And I would just pause here and say, uh, as far as the virgin birth thing, do you believe this stuff? Yeah, you, do you understand what God is asking you to believe? That a virgin would conceive. If God's going to settle out of court, he must be the one to come meet with us, and God is going to do the impossible. Second, God will bring light to the land of darkness. Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1 again, it talks about Galilee. It talks about the land of Naphtali and Zebulun. 
Between the prophecy from Isaiah and the time when Jesus was born, when he took on flesh, the people of Israel had been carried away. They had been, they had been destroyed by the Assyrians. They're carried away, and what the Assyrians did then, they brought other people to come and populate the Galilee. It was known as a place of darkness. It was, it was known of, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a place of, uh, of darkness where, where there are so many Gentiles, and it's the place where idolatry began among the people of Israel. That's how it was known, and, and God chooses to send his son and to put him in Galilee. He comes and he's in, he's in Galilee. It's not just, oh, well, I just kind of picked a place to live. It's part of God's plan that Jesus would live in Galilee. When you, you read in the Gospels, I think it's in the Gospel of uh, John when, when Andrew is introducing one of the future disciples to Jesus, and, and, he, and he tells him he's from Nazareth, and he replies, can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, that's where Jesus is from. A little further in one of the Gospels, it's, it's like uh, there were, there were um, some officials sent to arrest Jesus, and they come back, and they didn't bring him back, and, and they said, uh, why didn't you bring him? And they're, they're talking, or they're, they're talking about, uh, he's from Galilee, and they're talking about it, and they said, can, can any, not only can anything good come from Nazareth, but no prophet comes from Galilee. Don't you know the Scriptures? Well, actually, the prophet Nahum did. Prophet Jonah did. Elijah did. And Elisha, kind of one of those things, you know, when you're trying to prove a point, you're just trying to win an argument, and you make an over, overreach, you make an overstatement. And um, God will bring light to the land of darkness. He, that's what he does as he comes to Galilee. That's what he does when he comes to earth. Aren't you glad that our God came to a land of darkness? Because um, we still live in a land of darkness, and we're called to be the light. Number three, how will God negotiate this settlement? God must be the one to come and meet with us, and God will take on flesh like a child. Isaiah 6, excuse me, Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a child is born. Luke chapter 2, it says things like this about Mary. Expecting a child, baby, give birth, firstborn, a son, baby, baby, this child. To us a child is given. It declares the humanity of Jesus Christ. God must be the one to come and meet with us. He will take on flesh like a child. That is incredible. Fourth, God will rule through his son. Chapter 9, verse 6. To us a child is born. To us a son is given. It declares his deity. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. The angel says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you, will, you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the son of God. God will rule through his son. That's what he's saying here. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He's going to reign through his son. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. It's either two separate titles or it goes together. In, in, in uh, Judges, when the angel is talking to the mother of Samson, and they say, well, what's your name? And he says, Wonderful. But I think they go together, wonderful counselor. That he, he's, a, he's a counseling wonder. He needs no advice. When God talks to Job, he says to Job things like, where were you when I was creating everything, Job? You know, did I ask you for advice? You will find that more even in the book of Isaiah. Who does God go to to ask for advice? He goes to no one. In John chapter 7, when they went to arrest Jesus one time, and they came back and they didn't bring him, they said, why didn't you bring him? And they said to the officials, nobody speaks like he does. It's just the way that he talked, we, we couldn't do it. Or in, in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus finishes the Sermon on the Mount, and when he's, done, when he's done speaking, he says, and the people were amazed at his teaching. It's, it's the way that he spoke. He's a wonderful counselor. It says as well that he will be the mighty God. If you go back to the book of Exodus, when the people of Israel are in that process of coming out, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, all the things that God did declaring that he is the almighty God, that this one that we're talking about coming will be the mighty God. 
He will be the everlasting Father. And we think, well, no, wait, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How can He be the everlasting Father? It's probably better translated Father of Eternity. Father of Eternity in Isaiah chapter 43, when He says, Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. That He's the Father of Eternity. Jesus is the Creator. Jesus is the one who is the bringer of everlasting life. He's the Father of Eternity. He's also called the Prince of Peace, the source of peace, the person of peace, the champion of peace, the giver of peace, the one through whom we can have peace with God, we can have peace with others, and we can have peace with ourselves. that he's the champion of peace. That's who he is. It would be like if, if we had Jesus to vote for. Well, he should get our vote. The Prince of Peace. That, that's what we want, and God's going to rule through his Son. And this all refers to Jesus. And if God is going to come and he's going to negotiate or, or settle, help us to settle out of court and negotiate this, this settlement, he needs to be able to do the impossible and bring light to, into the land of darkness and take on flesh. And he needs to rule through his son. And he also needs to take care of unfinished business because there's unfinished business here in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. That hasn't been fulfilled yet. Right? It's not. Um, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. He hasn't done that yet. We're, we're, we're not there. It's that telescoping prophecy. We're, we're not there. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God will take care of all unfinished business. It would be like signing the contract for the house and to get that all taken care of and saying to my realtor, is there anything else I need to do? And the realtor would say, I'll take care of it. That's what God's going to do. He's going to take care of all unfinished business. All the prophets talk about the day of the Lord, right? You see that again and again, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, this time when he reigns, not only the day he comes, but when he reigns. And he's going to reign with justice and righteousness forever. Forever. No uncertainty. That time of uncertainty will be gone. And it's guaranteed by the zeal and activity of God himself. God says, I guarantee it. And you hear a little echo of the cross there. It is finished. The one thing today, in my opinion, would be this. God wants to meet with you. He wants to meet with you. Many of us have placed our faith in Christ, been following Jesus for a long time. God still wants to meet with us. He wants to meet with us, and he wants us to, 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 uh, to live, to enjoy this, this settlement out of court that we have with him. But if you're here today and you've never met with him, he's done it all. He's paid everything. He just wants you to come and to meet with him and to say, I accept this settlement out of court. In a sense, I want, I, he, he wants you to sign and say, you accept the settlement. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Pray with me. Father, Thank you for settling out of court, for doing everything that needs to be done. Thank you for laying it out so clearly in the book of Isaiah, so simply. Sometimes it's like, oh, it's, it's been there all the time. Thank you that you've come and you've paid the price. May we be those who are willing to meet with you to make that settlement official. In Jesus' name, amen. Next steps. Memorize Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Probably at Christmas time, you've already got that one memorized. Ask God for open doors for the good news as we go through this time of uncertainty. We proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's eternal good news. Third, accept the offer. If you never trusted Jesus, accept the offer to settle out of court. You've never had such a good deal. Oakwood, I want to read this part to you one more time. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. One day, one day the government will fully rest on his shoulders and we will be living in a kingdom of peace forever. Oka, don't forget that during this time of uncertainty. Represent Jesus well. Amen. Amen.